What comes to mind when I say food? <laughs> food. Probably that you're hungry right now, right? You can uh, feel that, the pit of your stomach if you didn't get any breakfast this morning. There's just something about food that brings people together, right? Something about having a meal with each other that just brings people together. Whether you knew that person before the meal or not, or whether you, you liked that person before the meal or not, there's just something about food that brings people together. I can still remember as a kid in our neighborhood, we'd have these heated competition battles of capture the flag or of, of pick up football or basketball. It didn't matter how upset we were with each other. When somebody's mom or dad brought out snacks, we all decided to take a breather, and we enjoyed that food together. Or, or any strategy, the best strategy of any college club to get people to show up is to offer free food. It doesn't matter if it's supposed to be hot and it's served cold, or if it's a little on the uh, warm side when it's supposed to be served, or when it's supposed to be cold, it doesn't matter. If it's free and it's food, college students show up. Food brings people together. I remember I told you about my time studying abroad in Florence. I was there on my birthday, and it was only a couple weeks into the program. I didn't know anybody, and yet on my birthday, I found myself at a dinner table surrounded by people from all over the world and all over the United States who I did not know two weeks prior. But we are united by this meal, by breaking bread together. Or over the past couple of weeks, here with our Table of Grace family, I think about our dessert parties and, and Buffalo Blues just a couple of weeks ago. Just an incredible time of getting to know one another over food and great music. But there's something about food that brings people together. And I think this is on purpose. In other words, I think that God actually designed us to be united by food to come together, to break bread with one another, to share meals together. I think that God designed food to be enjoyed with family. Over and over throughout Scripture, we talk about food. Food is an image that is used to communicate the faithfulness of God to God's people. One person who was particularly fond of talking about food was this guy named Jesus. Jesus. And if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 14, you'll see a story where Jesus talks about food. Now, to set this up, Jesus is in the home of a, of a prominent Pharisee. Now, to remind you, Pharisees were kind of like the all-star Jews of the day. And so here's Jesus invited into this Pharisee's home for a meal. And he notices that as the guests begin to show up, they each begin to sit in prominent places around the table. And so Jesus uses this as an opportunity to talk about humility. And as he's teaching them about humility, we pick it up in verse 12. Luke 14, 12 says, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or your sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might actually invite you back. So you'll have to be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And so in the midst of these Pharisees, as he's telling them to be humble, one Pharisee, one guest speaks up. And he says to Jesus in verse 15, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now when he says this, that term, kingdom of God, this feast in the kingdom of God is not just random. He's referring to an image of what's known as the messianic banquet, which we get in the book of Isaiah, chapter 25. In Isaiah 25, we hear these words. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. 
The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. This image of a banquet that God will prepare for God's people was something that became dear to the people of Israel. So dear that it was told about over and over. And as this tradition began to grow, one of the images was that the people of God at this, what they called the messianic banquet, because it was the banquet that would be thrown, the party that would be thrown when Jesus the Messiah shows up. One of the images was that they would actually be dining on Leviathan, which Leviathan is just this image that's used in Scripture, this beast that represents the evils of the world. And so at this grand feast that God will, will throw... We will eat the evils of the world simply as an image to portray God's power and the freedom and liberation that will be brought through Jesus the Messiah. We see this image again in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, as the prophet foretells this vision of the great heavenly banquet in which God's people will dine in peace without tears and without sadness. Over and over and over, this idea of the feast of the kingdom of God is present and anticipated. And so in Luke 14, when this particular guest speaks up and says, well, blessed are those who will feast and be at the banquet of the kingdom of heaven, there must have been something about the way he said it. Because then Jesus follows up with with this story, picking up in verse 16, Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet, and he invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they, all alike, they began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. And so here in the midst of these Pharisees, Jesus tells this story. Now, it's important to understand that the custom of the day is that a host in first century Palestine would throw a party and send out invitations weeks in advance. The invitations wouldn't say anything about what time the party was going to start because the custom was on the day of the party, that host would send out servants when the food was ready. So these people have already RSVP'd. The plans had already been made. And the servants were out gathering the guests. Let's put it in modern terms. Let's think about about planning a wedding. If you've been involved in the process of planning a wedding, you know that there are a a lot of details involved. You send out the save the dates. You send out the invitations. You begin to receive the replies. You have your little seating chart that as the replies come in, you you arrange, and then you rearrange, and then you re-rearrange, and you go over that list time and time again, making sure that you haven't left off anyone that might be offended. You've done your homework. You've booked the reception room. You've booked the entertainment. You've paid for everything. It is all set to go. The day of the wedding comes. The ceremony goes well. You look around, and all the guests that you've invited, they are there with you. And then as become a a custom in some weddings, the wedding party decides to take pictures. And so you you, uh, invite your guests to go enjoy a cocktail hour while you get your pictures taken. And so they all go over to the reception site and they're hanging out for a little bit while you're getting your pictures taken. And then at the moment when the bride and the groom arrive at the reception, it's time for the guests to make their way in 
to find their assigned seats. But for some reason, they've made it all the way to that point, and at that point, those guests, they start coming up with these crazy excuses. I mean, look at this. This guy says, I just bought a field. I must go see it. Who buys a field without seeing it first? The next one, I just bought some oxen. I've got to go try them out. Who buys, o- who, who buys oxen, first of all? Who buys oxen without trying them out? I know I've never bought an oxen without trying them out first. <laughs> and then this last one, I've just gotten married, and so I can't make it either. Okay, so there's some context to this as well. There was a Jewish law that when you got married, the husband was to spend a year at home with his new bride. Not a bad paternity leave plan there, right? I guess it wouldn't be paternity leave. No kids involved there yet. But there would be a year where the husband would spend with his bride. He was not allowed to go serve in the military. He was not allowed to go to work. There was a year dedicated to their bonding. So this guy would actually not have any plans because he was just married. This was their year to enjoy each other. So Jesus is basically painting a picture of these excuses that are just absurd. None of these excuses make sense. So you have a reception hall full of seats that are empty, a band that's ready to play, food that's already been paid for, but no guests. What do you do? You step outside and you say, free party! Anybody who wants to come in, you're welcome. It's already been paid for. Come on in. And that's exactly what the guy in Jesus' story does. He sends his servants out and says, go get the blind and the crippled and the lame and the poor and bring them into this banquet. And then I love how the story ends because the host says, well, yeah, there's empty seats, but we're not going to let those seats stay empty. Get back out there and bring even more people in. I don't want there to be a single empty seat so that those who so rudely refused my invitation, when they hear about the awesome party that we're having in here, there's not going to be any room left for them. So what's the point? Well, here's Jesus again. In the midst of this room of Pharisees, these these all-star Jewish people of the day, and the one guest speaks up and says, blessed is those, blessed are those who will feast at the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, hold on a second. Don't just assume that you're going to be at that feast. Don't just make the assumption because many have been invited who will not be present. Jesus takes this moment to say even though the Jewish people have been the people of God up until this point, through Jesus, through the Messiah, the seating chart now includes all people. You see, the banquet table of God, this table of grace, is a table where all are invited. God's table of grace is a table where your name is on the seating chart. John Wesley took this notion seriously. John Wesley was the founder of Methodism. And while many different denominations were arguing over different parts of theology of the sacrament of communion, which we refer to also as the table or as the Eucharist, but I'll get there in a second. While many people were arguing over this sacrament, John Wesley was just adamant that everybody was welcome to participate. So communion is a practice of the church that was initiated by Jesus Christ with his disciples. Sometimes we call it the Eucharist, which just comes from the Greek word for giving thanks. And so through the sacrament and this this process of communion, we give thanks as we remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Jesus initiated it over the years 
as this became a part of the church life, theologians began to argue over this question. What actually happens to the bread and to the cup when we take it? Does it actually become the blood and body of Jesus Christ? And so those traditions who do believe that the bread actually physically becomes Jesus' body and that the the juice physically becomes Jesus' blood, well, you can see how those traditions would be very hesitant to let just anybody handle the elements. I mean, the last thing you would want to do would be to spill a bit of Jesus' blood or to drop a part of Jesus' body. So they were very selective in who got to partake and participate in the sacrament of communion. The congregants of those traditions are really careful to make sure that their heart is in the right place before they partake because of how serious this is as Jesus' body and blood are actually present in what we call the elements. That makes sense if that's your tradition. Now, John Wesley and the Methodist tradition of which we are a part did not agree that the elements actually become physically the body and blood of Jesus Christ, but that they are a symbol that helps us remember and give thanks for Jesus' sacrifice. We do believe that Jesus is actually present in some mysterious way when we partake in communion, but the elements themselves are a symbol that point us to something greater. But you can understand how this difference in approach, a difference in perspective, leads to a difference in approach. And so while some traditions excluded those who were deemed unworthy to protect the sacrament itself, John Wesley and the people called Methodists encouraged the participation of those that society deemed as unworthy because... We believe that it is through the sacrament of communion that we receive God's grace. As Methodists, we believe that the communion table, God's table of grace, is open to all because this might be the very place that you experience the grace of God for the very first time. This open table invites you into communion with your Creator. The year was 1858. The state was Virginia. A woman named Ann Jarvis was burdened and bothered by the poverty and the disease that she saw in her community and the communities around her. So she started these clubs that would help address and and offer assistance and educate her communities. These clubs would even do things like teaching people to check the milk before they drank it, something that we take for granted because we have the dates printed on our cartons. These minor types of education to simply raise Awareness for health concerns. Well, in 1861, just a few years after she started these various clubs to address health concerns and and issues of poverty, the Civil War broke out. Now, in Virginia, there was a lot of dispute. Virginia was at the heart of the Civil War. So much so that in 1863, the western part of Virginia split from the rest and joined and formed their own state. And so it was in West Virginia that Ann Jarvis lived and began to feel a call to provide assistance for those families who had experienced the burden of destruction from the war. And to provide assistance for those soldiers who had experienced the destruction of injuries. 
And so she encouraged her clubs to reach out to these injured soldiers and their families. And you know what she did? She directed her clubs to meet their needs by giving them clothing that they needed, but by also providing them food. Now, can you guess which side of the conflict the soldiers were on that Ann Jarvis directed her clubs to feed? Both. Both sides. Ann Jarvis invited soldiers from the north and from the south to join together to be fed. Food brings people together. Oh, and so Ann Jarvis, these clubs that she started were called Mother's Day Work Clubs. These clubs were so inspirational to not only her community and to the rest of the nation, but her daughter, Anna Marie Jarvis, was so inspired by her mom that years later in 1908, she organized the first official Mother's Day, which we get to celebrate here today. Oh, and Ann Jarvis? This lady who brought people together from all walks of life to a common table and brought peace in the midst of darkness, she was a Methodist. You see, Ann Jarvis recognized that God's table of grace is open to all. And so she opened her own table to anyone who was in need. God's table of grace does not discriminate. It does not see boundaries or sides. It is open to all. It doesn't matter if you feel like this morning you're just in the zone with God. Or maybe this morning you feel like you are the least deserving person on the face of this planet, God's open table of grace is open to you. That is good news. This emphasis on the open table is the O of method, and it's another reason why I love being a United Methodist. Amen? Amen. Amen.